So Zena is a Roman archaeologist um, based at Royal Holloway and she specialises in the Roman Middle East and Roman Britain. Um, she's particularly interested, fittingly for today, sorry, I'm just, just sorry. Sorry. in how we present archaeology to the public um, and she's got loads of public engagement experience, particularly working with museums, um, including a previous project which was called Food for Thought, whose website is, I love the name of the website, it's not just dormice, mice, <laughs> and it's all about um, exploring Roman, it was all about exploring Roman food, memory and identity, and that was in partnership with um, Carinian Museum. Zina's current project is called Remembering the Romans in Middle East and North Africa, and she's going to share some of her insights with us today. Thank you, Zina. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. So thank you so much for inviting uh, me to be here. Um, I immediately said yes when Emma invited, partly because I knew there would be um, such a, a great set of people in the room. So uh, this is just um, uh, some reflections on things I've done, things I've learnt along the way. Uh, Emma had sent us a really useful set of framing questions, so I, there was no way I could answer all of them, but <laughs> you'll try and answer some of them uh, at least. Um, so, uh, it's broadly framed around what, how, and why uh, I do uh, public engagement. Um, so, the what, uh, I'm not going to read through all of this. this. This is just basically a chronology of uh, various um, projects that I've done. And I've put it up there just to show really how, uh, how these projects have transformed and how they relate to each other. Um, uh, which might not necessarily seem obvious. Um, so, uh, one of the things that Emma asked us to touch upon was how do you give uh, your project longevity? Um, and uh, I'm not sure any of mine have necessarily intentionally had longevity, but they have uh, quite organically often moved into being other things. So, Food for Thought um, became Digesting the Romans, uh, Retro. Uh, and kind of subsection, which was postcards of Palmyra, uh, and is becoming rematerialising Mopsall Museum. Um, and the other thing that you might notice as you go through is that certain names keep cropping up. Uh, so I really like working with Miranda Creswell, uh, who is a wonderful artist, uh, and that everything that I have done has only been possible because I've collaborated with other people. Um, so I couldn't do any of the things that I have done uh, on my own. Uh, lots of the work I do tends to involve uh, artists. Uh, I'm uh, particularly non-artistic myself. <laughs> I just really like working with artists. So I always need an artist to, to help me. Um, and uh, I should just give a little shout out because two of my students have actually just walked in uh, <laughs> uh, who did uh, postcards of Palmyra with me. So those collaborations take different forms um, and one thing I would say is if you find someone you enjoy working with keep trying to work with them because there's the people that it works very well with uh, and Miranda is one of those people um, and what came out quite organically uh, working with Miranda uh, is how we wanted uh, to engage this started when we did our projects in um, Horatio's Garden, which is a spinal injuries unit at uh, Salisbury Hospital. Um, and we decided very early on, uh, mostly in a drive down to Salisbury, that what we didn't want to do was do what I'm doing now, which is standing up in front of a group of people and talking at them. Um, nor did we necessarily want to force people in the hospital um, to come and uh, engage with us. Um, when I mentioned to various people that I was working in a spinal injuries hospital, uh, people would comment that oh, you've sort of got a captive audience, they can't get away from you. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we were quite explicit, so uh, there was a very uh, lovely member of the nursing staff who said, oh, I'll make sure people come down to the garden. We were like, no, 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 please, just if people want to come down, that's fine, but don't start you know, wheeling uh, patients down to see if that's not what we wanted. Um, uh, so, uh, Ever since then, I try to uh, make people feel as comfortable as they can uh, in any sessions and workshops that I run. So I try to make sure it's very informal uh, and that everybody joins in. Um, so uh, in this picture over here, uh, that's Miranda there, that's me, uh, that's Sarah Kadawi, who was one of the other uh, people uh, facilitating parts of the project. So we're all actually doing it 
together. Um, so if people feel a little bit nervous, maybe drawing, uh, they can feel a little bit better when they see the efforts, uh, the very, quite poor efforts that I've made. Um, in, then there were extra bits that came in under this um, kind of framework, I suppose, um, uh, when I started doing the Remembering the Romans uh, project. Um, uh, and partly because of the ethics of that project, and it's one thing that people don't often talk about when they're doing public engagement, but you are uh, talking uh, to people, uh, and in particular, as you'll see, I often end up using my engagement for my research. Uh, so thinking about the ethics of what you're doing and the people that you're working with, uh, in the Remembering the Romans project that was um, aimed at Middle Eastern communities, and you might unintentionally uh, kind of poke some painful parts of people's experiences. So you need to think about uh, how you're going to manage that. So because we were trying to do this form of uh, gentle engagement, it felt very false if at the end of the day we then presented everybody uh, with a uh, a feedback form to fill in with little tick boxes, how did you feel, rate us on you know, 1 to 10. Um, so while I'm sure that the um, impact officers in my institution are very unhappy that I didn't uh, get those forms filled in, what we did do uh, was we had guest books instead and um, I meant to bring them with me and I forgot. <laughs> Uh, but these were lovely and they were meant just for people just to scribble a little comment in at the end of the day that they developed in a way I hadn't anticipated, which is that people started putting uh, the art and the writing that they were doing into the book itself. So uh, we have this lovely um, archive uh, of what happened in the workshops. Uh, we also well, we had some baklava, so we're trying to make people feel at home. Uh, it's my favourite food stuff. Uh, but in terms of the ethics in particular here, uh, we made sure that we always had a quiet space if people wanted to uh, remove themselves from the room. So at the Petrie Museum, uh, we actually chose a day when the museum was shut uh, so that uh, the, the staff uh, very kindly gave us their office. And in the Great North Museum, we were separate uh, to the main museum. Uh, luckily, we didn't actually have to make use of that quiet space, but we had it there just in case we didn't upset anybody. Um, so the why, uh, I don't do it for the ref, um, <laughs> but these will become ref impact case studies. Um, so, uh, uh, but that's not uh, my reason uh, for doing it. Um, initially, I suppose, um, I did it because I felt the professional imperative uh, to communicate what I was doing. Uh, and also I've always found it to be mutually beneficial. Um, so I learn quite a lot uh, while I do it as well, uh, in all sorts of different ways, um, new perspectives on the material I'm handling, different ways of thinking about what I do. Um, so this photograph up here, this was um, one of the photographs taken by a participant in uh, one of the retro workshops. Um, it's actually about, uh, uh, African red slipware that I would normally just put up as a jug on the table. Uh, this is someone who comes from the early medieval um, world uh, who turned it on its side and tried to photograph it so it looked more like a chalice. Um, so people muck around with things in ways that you don't anticipate when I was doing that point. Exciting. Um, now uh, that has slightly changed. I still want to do all of these bits. Um, but because I'm uh, British Iraqi, um, the projects that I'm doing at the moment have a much more uh, personal element to them um, and are directly aimed at promoting well-being and reconciliation, um, hence needing uh, all the ethics and thinking uh, before them. So, um, so I think a key question to think when you're starting to do a public engagement project is who you're doing it for uh, and why you're doing it um, and that as I've shown that has slightly changed for me over time but now um, partly it's therapy for me uh, but also the people that I work with are right at the, the centre of what I do. If that then happens to be good for some rap people that's fine but they're not mine, that's not my target. Um, 
So one of the other things that Emma asked us to think about was how it links with our research. Um, and I suppose the traditional model is that you do a bit of research and then you do the engagement afterwards. Uh, particularly in my more recent projects that's been turned on its head. Uh, so the engagement happens uh, and then slightly accidentally in some ways uh, some research has come out of it. So for me at the moment those things are very closely connected uh, and it is not an optional add-on. There is no difference at the moment uh, in my work between what my engagement work is and what my research work is. So following on from Postcard to Palmyra, uh, which happened in uh, Trafalgar Square uh, when uh, the um, cheese-like arch uh, was on display, uh, that turned into a, a fairly traditional single-authored article in World Archaeology. Uh, if you want to see me ranting about the Institute for Digital Archaeology while hiding behind some postcards, uh, that's the article. <laughs> um, uh, but probably the one I like even more um, was one that came out of the Retro Project uh, and was published in a, a new journal called Epoyersen, which is a, a journal for creative engagements with history and archaeology, uh, which run by someone called Sean Graham. Uh, it's completely open access, it exists online, but we did do a, a paper copy as well. Um, I can highly recommend publishing with Sean. Uh, if you have some projects that you'd like to, to get out there, uh, he has a, a, a really interesting approach to uh, trying to undercut uh, the publishing world, so there's no article processing fees. Uh, uh, rather than having the terrifying reviewer number two, uh, the reviews are actually responses. They're published alongside what you publish as well, so everything is open um, and visible. Um, and this particular one, probably the most uh, fun uh, I've ever had writing a publication, uh, probably because actually very little of it was written by me, um, it was actually written by all the people um, who participated in the workshops for Retro. Um, whether they were um, <coughs> students who worked on it, uh, museum curators, people who came to the workshops, people who facilitated, uh, everybody wrote this collaboratively. Um, so some of the lessons learned, these tend to have been things that I've maybe not quite got right or I've underestimated. Um, so choosing the right space. Um, I think we tend to rely on some quite traditional spaces to work in and I'm just as guilty of this myself so it's quite easy to go to a school, uh, it's quite easy to work in a museum but they're not always the right space so thinking a bit more creatively um, about what spaces uh, you might engage in so that could be in a library, you could just put yourself in a cafe, you could go to a garden, a uh, public garden. Um, so where would your audience feel comfortable? So one thing that I think I made a mistake on with the retro project was putting it in a museum uh, and it made it really difficult for me <laughs> to find my audience. I think it's one of the reasons it made it difficult for me to find my audience uh, because Middle Eastern communities uh, are not necessarily, um, uh, being in mu museum spaces is not necessarily a comfortable space uh, from, from, from most people from a Middle Eastern background so it was quite difficult to get people through the doors. Uh, so the next version, uh, rematerialising Morsel Museum, although based on museum objects, uh, it will definitely not take place inside a museum and hopefully that will help people um, feel more comfortable with coming to the events. Uh, so in terms of finding your audience, um, I think language uh, is really key uh, in slightly different ways. Um, so uh, However hard often I try to make things sound friendly and informal, I sometimes miss the mark. Um, and uh, <coughs> I remember one person saying to me about the, the retro project, but, but I mean, thankfully they came. But they said, oh, I was really worried, it sounded like it was really intellectual, and I tried so hard not to make it sound uh, super intellectual, but clearly I hadn't quite got the mark right. Um, also, if you are going to work with a community whose first language might not be English, um, you might want to make sure that some of the communications that you're doing uh, are not in English. So for remembering the Romans, uh, we did things in Arabic as well. Um, 
not everyone will want to play with you. That's been quite a painful thing to learn. You put together this lovely project, you think you're doing a really good thing, uh, you'll take it to someone and you might just get a flat outright no. Um, so and I've been told some things that have been quite painful, so for rematerialising Walsall Museum, a refugee charity told me they offer practical help. Um, when you also think you're offering practical help but of a different kind, that's uh, quite a difficult thing uh, to hear. So sometimes building those relationships uh, can take quite a lot of time. Um, and time and energy, I would say, are probably the thing that people don't think about as much as they should uh, when they're doing public engagement. It takes a lot of time and energy to do public engagement well. Um, so just to run one workshop, that's probably weeks of work leading up to it. Lots of emails. Uh, if it's not quite going very well because you can't find your audience and refugee charities won't work with you. There's also quite a lot of tears and emotional energy involved. So I probably cried more over doing public engagement work than I ever have about any work that involved me just sitting in a library. Uh, but uh, it is extraordinarily uh, rewarding. So don't underestimate those. Uh, so that sounds a little bit negative, that side. So I thought we'd end on something more positive, which is that when it goes right, that's what you get. You get a wonderful wall full of creativity uh, and people mucking around with the past and making it their own. Um, and, then, and then if you're really lucky, someone will say the most wonderful thing uh, and you just think, one person, yes, they did it, it right. Uh, and that makes uh, all of those tears that happened uh, worthwhile. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, feel free to drop me a line or tweet me uh, uh, or chat to me over coffee. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Laura Swift. Uh, Laura, is yeah. um, based in the Department of Classical Studies at the Open University and she specialises in archaic and, Greek, um, and classical Greek poetry and drama. Um, she's currently the recipient of the Philip Lee Hume um, Research Prize, and since 2016, she's been working on a project which explores the fragments of ancient Greek tragedy. Um, as part of that research, she's been collaborating with the theatre company, Potential Difference, um, to produce a new play based on those fragments. Um, and there were work in progress previews of the play performed in Oxford and London towards the end of last year, and that's what she was talking just about today. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thank you very much, and um, it's, this is a fantastic event, so thank you for organising it, Emma. And I thought, listening to Zina's presentation, I was really struck by how, although my project is really different in a lot of ways, a lot of the, the lessons and issues I think are really similar, um, and I'm sure that will be a theme that we come back to during the day. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of give an overview of the project and, and also the process um, and along the way talk a bit about um, lessons and challenges um, um, and try to hopefully answer some of the questions that Emma sent us before, um, this, before today's event. Um, so my academic background, as, as Emma said, so I started out in Greek tragedy, then I moved into lyric. Um, and as a tragedy person, I'd done various academic consultancies for theatre projects, um, which was much more of a type where somebody has a play, they're putting it on, they call you in as an expert, you go in for maybe a day, you impart your wisdom to the cast and crew, and they ask you questions about how does X work in Greek tragedy, how do you pronounce this character's name, or whatever. Um, then you go away, so it's very much... Um, it was great fun, it's been fantastic doing it, um, but this was very different um, because in those other projects I had very little input and stake in the project. Um, I was very much coming into something that other people, creative practitioners, had developed. Um, and in my, from my work on Lyric I was really struck by how um, there are thousands of tragic fragments out there. Um, and the work on them is very reconstructive, that it's very much where does this fragment fit in this play, what happened, how can we work out the rest of the play. Um, and that's very different from research and lyric, where people have to be much more um, open to dealing with 
the aesthetic and cultural and literary significance of a fragment, even if it's only a, a few words long, because that's all you have half the time with Greek lyric. Um, and so I was kind of intrigued by the, the artistic potential of fragments um, and doing something with tragic fragments artistically and performatively um, that wasn't just about trying to reconstruct them and put on a play that was running from start to finish. And so that was kind of the, the genesis of this idea. Um, and the first stage was, I'd had this idea at the back of my head, I'd had discussions with various people, um, including potential difference. Um, the first kind of breakthrough of the project was firstly that I was accepted onto a scheme called Communicating Ancient Greece and Rome, that um, I think Emma and, and Zina were also on, um, which was a public engagement scheme for people in classics. Um, but it came with a, a small pot of money that you could use flexibly to fund any project of your choice that had something to do with public engagements and classics. Um, and we also were able to get, get a spot in the first Being Human Festival um, in 2014, which also came with a small pot of money. And combining both those pots of money meant that we had enough budget to actually do something. Um, so we were able to bring a creative team together and spend some time brainstorming and seeing what we could do with fragments in a way that was quite low stakes because we were putting on something in the Being Humans Festival but it was free so people weren't going to go and be appalled if it wasn't very good. Um, it was quite short. Um, um, it came with a panel discussion so we could kind of fill in. It wasn't something that ran start to finish as a polished piece of theatre at that stage. Um, and so, and the whole process has been very much one of iteration and trying things in a small way uh, with relatively low stakes that's not too daunting and scary, seeing what works, um, and then building from that and accessing s small pots of money and then slightly larger pots of money. Um, and part of that process is that you'll probably see in the pictures that quite a lot of the same faces keep on recurring because f since 2014 then we've been able to work with say, some of the same artists over that period. And that's also been incredibly important to the development of the project, that it's very much been um, a two-way, well, multiple-way collaboration with everybody involved shaping it. It's not been me going, this is what I want to do and you guys are all going to do it. Um, so the, the picture on the left is some early workshops um, in preparation for the festival, and the picture on the right is from the festival performance where it's got these images of papyri, um, Ben who's in the sitting up on the chair on the table is, uh, it was kind of a little tableau inspired by the idea of papyri being written on by scribes and discarded and rediscovered and analysed that was just probably 20 seconds of, um, um, of an idea. So the the process of developing, as you can see, is quite long and complicated, and so we had the performance in the Being Human Festival. Um, the reason I put in the next point, life gets in the way, is that I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. If you're doing a project that you plan to be sustained and ongoing and involve a partnership over a long period, which is great and it's also what a lot of funders want, but developing things over that time scale um, you don't know what your life's necessarily going to be like in six months' time or two years' time. And the project has to work around what happens to you, what happens to your partners. So in our case, then, I had a baby, in fact, two weeks before the Being Human Festival, which was a complicated um, that particular <laughs> showing. Um, so I, I was on maternity leave. Um, potential difference with then involved in another project, which was taking up all of their time. Um, and it was... The next point I've put on because, it coming back to the points that were raised in the previous discussion about time, I was then very fortunate to get the Philip Levy Hume Prize in 2016. Um, and it was having this chunk of time which was incredibly flexible because the Levy Hume Trust trusts you to do whatever you want as long as it is in some way connected with or facilitating your research. Um, and I think without that opportunity, it would have been incredibly difficult to devote the time which the next stages of the project took up, it would have been very challenging um, to do that alongside an, um, a full-time 
teaching job um, because the next stages were incredibly intensive um, and time consuming. Um, and our original plan was actually to delay the next stage slightly further into my leaving him time, but the timing of these things is obviously de dependent as, as well as by your own circumstances by funding opportunities. And we were able to get some little bit of money from different sources. So we got some money from um, internally from the OU, we got something from HIFE, we got some money from the ESRC, I was able to use some of my Leaving Him funds towards the project and all these different sources actually managed to amount to a bigger pot that we could then do something more ambitious with. Um, and again, then we had this ongoing process of iteration, trying things, uh, each time making it slightly bigger, um, involving a different group, seeing how they responded to it. So we did two days of workshops with um, MA drama students at East 15 Acting School, um, where we were able to just test out ideas um, with quite a big group of people, see how they respond to it. Um, then in July, we did a much more intensive focus. Um, we did a week of workshops with um, professional artists. And then in September, October, that was the really intensive period when we were in full-on workshopping and rehearsals for our work in progress performance. Um, the other thing to say about the ESRC money was that we got that um, because we were very keen to explore ideas of fragmentation more broadly, not just fragments of ancient texts. And so we had some money to work with a neuroscientist, um, um, Mark Stokes from Oxford University, um, and to explore ideas around fragmentation and ways in which we experience that as human beings. So memory and attention and perception and the ways in which our, our narrative of the world, which we usually obviously perceive as um, ongoing, is in fact built up from fragments. Um, and that was incredibly enriching because that was something we've been exploring and talking about with actors back when we were doing the preparations for being human, but we didn't have the conceptual language to get very far, and at the time we felt there was potential, but we were constantly getting blocked and finding it frustrating. Um, and having some discussions with Mark, and having the time to actually go and read um, about the subject, had opened up that area for us. Um, so, and these slides I put up to kind of show again the process that the, the the one on the left is August 2016 um, and we were doing a mind map of basically all the elements that we felt were important to the project and trying to group them together um, on an incredibly hot day um, which is why it was outside um, and then this is January um, 2017 where by this stage we've got more like a storyboard where we've got kind of elements in the plot arc of the play with then mind mappy ideas at below and we're trying to slot them in. So the point I wanted to make was that there are these bits that stick out in the narrative of, particularly when you're talking to funders about, we will have X event and it will involve these many people and it will be in this venue. But it, the process of developing it involved a lot of informal meetings and you know, discussions we go go to speak to Mark in his office and we'd just have a chat over coffee and um, we'd have informal discussions um, among ourselves. Um, we were discussing with venues, we were trying to get create other creative partners on board. And so there, there's a lot of behind the scenes work, which is obviously a point that Zina made as well earlier about the, the amount of time that has to go in before you can organise something that's flashy and uh, members of the public might actually come and see. Um, so, that and the, the week of workshops in July um, set us up for the most recent stage of the project, which was um, this September, October, um, where we did four weeks of workshops, um, and which culminated in, in the last week, um, three performances in Oval House in South London. Um, and so that's um, the, the, the kind of core artists, those are the four performers, um, me and Russell sitting around a table, uh, Russell's the director, um, um, discussing brainstorming scripts. Um, and the kind of core ideas we wanted to explore, um, and Oval House 
is their first bite series is quite low stakes again that it's not meant to be a polished performance um, people differ in how polished it is for work in progress but people people are paying a um, only five pounds to come and see it. Um, they're aware that it's work in progress and that their feedback is welcome. So again, um, it reduces the the risk factor for for, um, for developing, and it's a really good opportunity to then get feedback from a, a bigger group of people. Um, so some of the ideas we were trying to explore were the idea that you can, if you have a fragmentary piece of text, the multiple possibilities for reconstructing it. So we were doing. A scene from the the Euripidean tragedy Cresfontes, where um, there's a, a fairly substantial amount of text from the prologue, but you could interpret it in different ways, and we've been playing around with increasingly silly ways of how you could stage it. So it um, uh, the character comes back and is and questions some other anonymous character about. Um, what's going on, what's the story so far in the kingdom is, and um, we, we had the idea of re rebooting this and doing it in different, who, who is this person he's talking to, how does that change the dynamic, how does that change what we understand of the play. So there's um, Alistair, the, the um, this younger actor, um, is um, Cressfontes or Telefontes as we called him in our version because uh, to avoid confusion with two characters with the same name um, in the play. Um, and he's talking to, firstly, the, the servant character is firstly a grumpy um, security guard, um, and then he's bullying a, a young servant in the palace, and then here he's chatting to a guy in, in the bar who's getting drunk and spilling the beans too much. Um, another idea we wanted to explore was the idea of fragmentation as... Um, something that you overhear or misremember or you have partial access to. So listening through doors, um, how can you evoke people's interest in stuff that's going on off stage? Uh, one of the key scenes of the ancient play, we have absolutely nothing left of, so we have the idea of what, what happens if you don't actually see anything in that scene. All you see is um, somebody's response to something they can hear off stage with a couple of words and people's memories of it afterwards which are all conflicting and slightly incompatible. Um, another challenge we struggled with a lot was why can't people talk? That we didn't want to write bits of phony Euripidean dialogue between main characters because that felt to undermine the whole purpose of doing something with fragments. So. Um, why might people not be able to speak? Um, so we, we had this dinner scene which is very tense and icy, perpetually being interrupted by the waiter coming in to um, pour drinks and the character's not going to speak in front of him. Um, another element we were really interested in was um, puppetry because we liked the idea of, um, at the heart of puppetry is that you impose meaning on something that is lifeless, that a puppet that it is a, a puppet is a fragment that you then turn into something that's alive and dynamic and imbue with emotion and causality. Um, and so we worked with um, a performer who's also um, uh, a puppeteer to think about puppetry, not in the sense of marionette type puppets, but also in the sense of papyrology, that how can, how can the images of papyrus and physical fragmentation be, become artistic? Um, and so these are some sort of early ideas that we were playing with in July, um, and this is a uh, slightly more developed version that we actually came up with for um, October. Um, and I've got a, a little clip which I'll try to play now of this is the some of the the ideas around pathological puppetry.
if he dwells below in the underworld. If he dwells below in the underworld, amongst those, amongst those who are no more. Another metaphor we were interested in exploring was ways in which we, as humans, piece things together. That methodologically, as scholars working on texts, we're you know, trying to reconstruct, we're trying to make connections, and we were thinking about other metaphors, um, um, detectives, for example, um, journalists, different ways in which um, people are trying to make sense of scraps of information. Um, and that also tapped into something that was also an important goal of the project, which was, it's quite hard to describe it in a way that doesn't make it sound incredibly intellectual. Um, and we didn't want it to be an intellectual worthy experience where everybody sat down and had to deal with all this technical stuff with classics and neuroscience. We wanted it to be fun and exciting and engaging. Um, and, so, and, we want, and one of the ways we tried to do that was having these moments of humour um, having moments of music, so um, we had a, a muse who sung jazz and we worked with her to write some songs for the performance. Um, and um, the kind of art on the OHP wasn't just to do papyrological type puppetry, we also did it to create this kind of, this is a scene where the papyrologist, um, while working on the papyrus, imagines himself as though he were an, an, a cliché noir detective solving a murder case, um, and the muse transforms him in, into that sort of world. Um, and essentially, the the process was very much driven by the actors. That the script we went in with in September was very rough. It was a completely collaborative process where they. Um, um, We'd, we'd come up with a scene or some ingredients for a scene, we'd work on it with them, we'd work out what worked and what didn't. Um, and there were a lot of challenges to that on the way, and that was part of what made it an incredibly in intensive process because we were constantly rewriting as we went. So, a couple of points to summarise um, on what, you know, the challenges and what I've learned from it is, I mean, the, the main thing I'd say was it's been an incredibly empowering, exciting experience. I've got a huge amount out of it and it's given me a window into a different world. I think, following on from what Zena said, I found it really important that I was able to go in um, with a kind of blue skies idea of, I hope this will lead to some research, I think it will lead to some research, but I didn't go in with the idea of, I will do this thing that relates to this article I have written, or I will do this thing and that will feed into this chapter on this monograph that I will publish in two years' time. That I don't think the artistic performance wouldn't have been, would have been as good if I'd been driven by that rather than the artistic goals. Um, which isn't to say that I, I so I think it, I hope it will generate research, but it's been uh, it's been really important to me not to let that dominate my thinking on the project. Um, the other learning thing which I've already touched on is the amount of time and energy that these things take up. That um, any ongoing project. Um, anything with lots of different funders and different requirements and moving parts um, and anything that involves intense rehearsals towards a performance is really time consuming and I think it, it's important that it matters to you. Um, I, there's no way I could have done it if it hadn't been, firstly if I hadn't had the time, but also if it hadn't been close to my heart and close to my research interests. Um, and so I'd say if anybody who's thinking of developing a public engagement project, um, it's only worth doing. Um, if you can do it well, but it's only possible to do it well if if you can um, put yourself into it, um, if you can find the, the time and emotional energy um, that justifies you know, the cost that it will take up. But I would wholeheartedly recommend doing it because it's been one of the most exciting things I've done in my academic career. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so Mike is based here at the School of Advanced Study, um, which, of which the ICS is one of nine humanities member institutes. Um, he's the public engagement manager for the school as a whole, um, and he also curates the Being Human Festival, which is the UK's only national festival of the humanities. Um, his own research focuses on literary and cultural theory, the arts and health, and collaborative artistic practice. Um, and a few years ago, he also ran an inspiring engagement project, um, which I would urge you to, to look up, um, the Bloomsbury Festival in a Box, which <coughs> aimed to bring something of the, the festival experience to socially isolated people who were living with dementia. Um, but he's going to talk to us today about being human. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my first couple of slides are going to be my introduction. Oh, so. <laughs> that's, that's really helpful. Um, can I just check how many of you had heard of Being Human Festival before today? Yeah, good. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, so um, I guess what I want to do today really is just take you through a little bit of the thinking behind the festival and how it works, what we're trying to achieve, uh, and maybe just look at a couple of examples of um, how classicists have engaged with the festivals and maybe what that tells us about a couple of different uh, pathways to public engagement more broadly. Um, so I've got a few examples to go through. Some of the people uh, uh, I selected for examples are actually in the room, so uh, maybe they can check in as well when it comes to the, the questions. Um, so the, the two sides of what I do really, Emma has already touched upon, but just to, just to kind of gloss that again. Um, so I, I oversee the Being Human Festival run that, um, but I've also, uh, I also still do public engagement myself uh, with my kind of researcher's hat on. And I ran an AHRC funded project um, a couple of years ago called Bloomsbury Festival in the Box, which again was working with festivals, but it was about ta taking festivals out into the homes of people who can't leave their homes to come to the festival. Um, and it's specifically working with people uh, with dementia um, in Camden and Bloomsbury. Um, so that's more of a kind of an action research project, I guess. Um, but by far the largest thing that I work on is Being Human Festival, which is just entering into its fifth year this year. So um, we started Being Human in 2014. Uh, it's the only, the first and still the only national festival of the humanities. And really what it does, it's, it's different to, I don't know, like Hay and Why or um, Cheltenham Festival or something like that. It really is focused on taking humanities research and communicating it to people in, um, in kind of meaningful and accessible <coughs> and fun ways. So we run it from um, the School of Advanced Study in partnership with the HRC and the British Academy who also fund it. And as I say, it really is about kind of high quality public engagement in the humanities. Um, we want to support researchers in the humanities and provide kind of incentives and opportunities for them to do public <coughs> engagement work. We also want to kind of change the culture a little bit of public engagement activity in the humanities, which, like the humanities themselves, has tended to be slightly kind of siloed, I guess. So you tend to see pockets of best practice, so maybe public history, public classics, um, people engaging with literary festivals, um, art historians curating exhibitions, and so on. Uh, but what hasn't happened in the humanities, perhaps in quite the same way as it has in the sciences and in STEM, is uh, a kind of joining of forces, so people um, coming together as a humanities community. And that's part of what we've been trying to build over the past few years <coughs> in the festival. So how it works, really, is um, we offer some funding. So that's part of the incentive that we offer. So we offer small grants to develop activities. Uh, Laura is a really good example of somebody who had a grant from us in 2014, and that's had a, a kind of pretty incredible afterlife and, and legacy. Um, they are quite small grants, so we would typically, uh, it could be anything between kind of 500 quid 
up to about 2,000 at the, at the largest. But we're, we're talking that kind of scale. This is not kind of Arts Council funding to do it to a hugely ambitious project. Um, but we do also offer, I guess, kind of infrastructure as well. So a big part of what we do with the festival is actually offer support um, to people who are um, at various stages on their public engagement journey. So from kind of professors to ECRs to PhD students. Um, so we offer some training, we offer um, centrally produced marketing um, and resources advice, one-to-one -one advice, people can pick up the phone and speak to us, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, so as I say, it really is kind of about putting in place, I think, infrastructure that wasn't there before, and I think that's one of the, the reasons that the festival has taken off, perhaps in the way that it has, it's grown very quickly <coughs> over the past few years. Just to give you a sense of the scale of this thing, I mean, you, you've, um, some of you have got the, the program from last year on your tables. Um, but it's a big thing. So we had 350 events last year, right across the UK, uh, 56 towns and cities. Um, we're particularly keen at the moment to uh, take activities into towns and cities where there is no university or where there's a very sharp town and gown divide and actually we're just kind of evaluating last year's festival now but we found that of those 56 10 cities or towns didn't have uh, a university there which is, which is really good for us um, 87 organizing institutions most of those are universities but it's not exclu exclusively universities so we're also open to independent research organisations. We've had um, activities organised by museums, archives, <coughs> uh, places of learning, really, uh, or places with strong humanities connections. About 30,000 attendees, that's our footfall nationally. Many more actually engaging online. And um, really kind of quite a significant number of academics uh, getting involved as well. And as I said, it's, it's quite a nice mixture of uh, people who are very senior, people who are really just kind of starting out in academia. And last year, for the first time, we did have some international activities as well. So we had a uh, event in Singapore, um, and one at the British School of Rome, um, at the University of Melbourne, and in Paris at the University of London's Institute in Paris. So we're just kind of starting out on our internationalisation, but that's, quite, that's been quite an interesting um, thing to do, actually, just to kind of open up this conversation about humanities and about public humanities into an international context, because we're finding it means very different things um, across the globe. <coughs> just to give you an example of the sort of thing that we do, we do a really, really wide range of, of different things actually. And I think something that's coming out quite clearly already in all of the talks <coughs> that we're having this morning, <coughs> public engagement can mean anything from kind of massive, large-scale museum like to the Ashmolean Museum, and we, we've had those as part of the programme, to kind of small walking tour with five people on it. And actually, both of those, both ends of the spectrum and between have, have real value. And I think one of the things that I would stress actually is that not to, not to kind of underestimate the value of starting small um, and thinking about what's achievable um, and, and, and will be kind of fun for you to do. Um, but just an example actually at the kind of slightly larger end of our spectrum, this was an event um, in Sheffield a couple of years ago that did called Intoxicants at Sheffield Tap. Uh, does anyone know the Sheffield Tap? Has anyone been there? The Sheffield Tap is a pub, okay, in Sheffield Railway Station. And this was an event that was put together by a, a kind of multidisciplinary research team who are looking at the history of intoxication. So they're looking at everything from uh, the history of kind of different drinking vessels to uh, drinking songs, pub culture, um, and it's a collaboration between the uh, Royal, Royal College of Art and Sheffield University. So um, 
what they did, again, moving outside of the kind of educational spaces, they did an event in a pub, uh, and they had a kind of sing song of drinking, drinking songs, uh, interspersed with some short talks about the research that they were doing. Um, part of that audience they kind of brought with them from the programme, and part of it was just people out for a night out in the pub. And uh, I wasn't there myself, but apparently it went really, really well, and people did actually join in with the drinking songs, which I think is uh, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, human classics. I did a little search of our uh, website just to, to try and pull out some examples of, of uh, classics events over the past few years. We've had loads. So, um, there's Laura's event from the very first year. Uh, we had an event here uh, using um, uh, virtual reality stuff and 3D printing, so it's kind of 3D classics. Uh, we had some collaborations with the Petri Museum last year, and this was an interesting one on the University of Roehampton's campus, because apparently, again, I don't know this really, but um, they have lots of kind of uh, classical follies around the, around the campus and they did a, a walking tour around there. So um, just a couple of um, different formats that people have used. This again is from the first year back in 2014. Um, this was an event led by um, Eleanor Dickey at um, University of Reading. I think she's moved on to Exeter now actually. Um, <coughs> It was a recreation of a, an ancient classroom. And I think when you, when you kind of look at these pictures and, and the way this is pitched, I think in a way this, this looks like a kind of slightly familiar style of kind of classics public engagement. Maybe, uh, you know, people kind of wearing um, sort of togary type outfits. Um, but I think one of the things that I want to stress is that there's absolutely like nothing wrong with that, actually. The, the kind of, the, the sort of basic, um, sort of uh, nuts and bolts cl uh, classics public engagement is actually a really really valuable part of our program and something that we're, we're keen to support. A very different style of event was again something that happened in the first year of the, <laughs> of the project involving chickens. Um, do people know about the AHRC chicken project? <laughs> 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 something about this yeah. from my life. <laughs> um, this, this is a project all about human chicken interactions, <laughs> yeah. which um, they, they slightly kind of invited controversy around, but it, it did actually end up in the Daily Mail. This was, this was something that um, the AHRC gave a large grant to of, um, of over a million pounds, and it ended up on the, uh, you know, front page of the Daily Mail in a kind of like public money spent on chickens kind of way. Um, but they embraced that controversy and used it as a kind of pivot for public engagement. It's all about looking at how this, this very kind of common domestic um, animal ended up in, um, in the kind of Western world, seeing as it originates in Asia. Um, and that's something that's not very widely known um, and it's, it's been under-researched. So it's a collaboration between classicists, historians, ancient historians, and scientists. Um, and as I say, it's a very kind of large um, um, research project. They did an event for us at Bindalanda. So um, again, using a, a fairly well kind of established piece of um, infrastructure there. Um, and they did a kind of um, a drop-in event with various stalls exploring um, different things, chicken bones, um, and various various other things. But they also collaborated with a local charity called Hen Power, which is uh, Hen Power. I love these names. <laughs> um, but that's about um, giving people kind of companion creatures, so socially isolated people again, um, um, taking kind of chickens um, into people's uh, homes and into old people's homes in a kind of pet kind of way. Um, one of the things I thought was really good about this is that, as I say, they kind of embraced the, the kind of controversy around the project and used it as a, as a hook. Um, so they managed to get some press coverage out of that, which was really good. So that's kind of local, local press that they generated. Um, 
And they just, they just did fantastically well at kind of building up an energy around it. They actually did a follow-on event the next year that was kind of stand-up comedy as well, because they, whenever you say Chicken Project, people laugh. Um, and again, they kind of embraced that and did a, a nice stand-up comedy around, around chickens. Um, this is one, uh, this is an example where the, the organiser is actually in the room, so you can talk about this as well, maybe in the questions, Paula. Um, but this was an event uh, organised by Paula Locke, who was a PhD student at the University of Kent. And Paula, I think I'm right in saying that your research is really about uh, Roman bars and yes. drinking culture, is that right? Um, <coughs> so Paula put together for us this really fantastic event that was basically a sensory smell walk around Canterbury um, using this fantastic kind of kit of recreated classical drinks, smells, um, sensory kind of prompts um, and using that as a kind of way of introducing people to Roman remains and Roman ruins um, in Canterbury, and this is Sarah Churchwell, who's the festival director, sampling some. What, what's it called? The, the fish sauce. The fish <laughs> sauce. I haven't got the good picture. You need the picture where she's actually tasted it. Her face is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's quite representative of her reaction, actually. <laughs> um, so again, just a really kind of an imaginative and accessible way to start thinking about. Um, I guess. Um, that kind of gentle introduction, or the, the kind of accessible introduction to, um, to classical research. And also kind of getting people out. Because we found that this, this, kind of, um, this kind of thresholdism that people have mentioned a few times is really kind of significant for us. Um, and the, the Sheffield Tap event in the pub, the really good example of taking, taking the event to the place that people already go to. Uh, or connecting an activity to people's existing interests and, and passions and things that they would spend their leisure time doing. So, um, I mean, just to finish up, really, um, this is something that I'm increasingly interested in, both in, in my own research and, and with the festival, really, is where are these where are these kind of entry points and how do we how do we think carefully about connecting research to people's everyday life everyday experience and everyday interests um, an example from last year's program that i've just pulled out this picture is actually from the website of the national leather collection which is based in northampton which i'd never heard of before doing this festival um, but northampton um, as some of you might know, is famous for its leather industries and shoemaking history. Uh, and they have this um, slightly kind of uh, rickety but very interesting uh, museum, which has an amazing collection, which incorporates everything from samples of you know, shoemaking stuff from Northampton's own industries right through to Egyptian shoes. Um, and we had a, a series of activities there last year organised by the University of Northampton. They did basically a kind of lunchtime series of talks. So again, a very accessible time for people. Um, using the kind of research skills of, of academics to animate this collection and to bring out some of the, um, some of the kind of depth and nuance of it. And I think for me that's, that's a good example really of, of how um, you can, you can take a kind of a, a very local context and a very kind of local collection and use it as a way of drilling down and connecting things back to, in, in this instance, the kind of classical world and antiquity, um, while still keeping it very kind of local and meaningful to people. Because we do find that every year for our evaluations that people are interested in why, why is this relevant to me? Uh, and like that can mean like to me in Northampton you know what what has antiquity got to do with me here there it is Egyptian sandals Egyptian shoes in Northampton that's what I want to see more of um, so 
Am I over time? Or, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to get in touch, please do. Here's, here's my contact details. But also just to say that we're currently in the process of throwing, throwing out the, the call for applications for the festival this year. So our theme this year is Origins and Endings, which lends itself quite nicely to uh, the classical world, I think. Um, all of the details on how to get involved in the festival um, are online at the <coughs> URL. Um, on, I'll be around so we can have a chat about it as well. And um, yeah, do, do pitch us something and do, do get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jess is based in the Department of Classical Studies at the Open University um, and her research work combines material and approaches from classical studies, from art history and from religious studies. Um, she runs the Votives Project with Emma Jane Graham which thinks about ways in which people use votive, votive offerings. Um, she's also interested in classical reception and this came up in Laura's talk. Jess actually edits the online journal Practitioners' Voices in Classical Reception Studies, Open Access Online Journal, um, which, is a, which is a way of putting academics and practitioners in dialogue with one another. Um, she's co-founder and producer of the podcast Classics Confidential, and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, and thank you very, very much for inviting me. I've been really looking forward to this and seeing our friends and hearing about all these fantastic projects. Um, I don't know, I mean, some people will definitely have heard of Classics Confidential because they've been on it. <laughs> I know there's a handful of people in the room who I recognise from either past programmes or future ones that we're going to produce. And anyone who wants to know more about Zena's research <laughs> can head to the episode about Roman food, which I think is probably one of the favourite ones that I've ever done. Um, so yeah, Podcasting Classicist Sharing Research. It started in 2010. It was initially Broadcasting Classicist. I'll tell you a bit about that switch in a, in a moment. Um, I thought maybe it was a, a bit different from some of the other projects that we've heard about today because it's not really linked to a research project, certainly not my research project, although my research has benefited from it in kind of unexpected ways. Um, it's not funded either, it's very much small, you know, started very, very small scale. And you know, I will come on to the time issue later, but I think one nice thing about not necessarily being funded or kind of having institutional deadlines and that kind of thing is it's something that you can sort of drop in and out of in a way. So there's been times where I've been quite active with this and other times where you know, I've had a year or doing pretty much nothing. Um, so I'll just very briefly go through the sort of trajectory from 2010 to the present and just try and pick out some of the themes that Emma raised in her questions. I mean, it started, um, I just came across, this was before like the current craze in podcasts, came across Dan Ariely, I don't know if you know, from Cognitive Science and Psychology, and he, did, he started this podcast, Arm in the Donkeys, and I just thought it sounded like such a brilliant idea, and the kind of thing that would work really well for classics, so um, stole it, basically, although I did write to Dan and got some advice from him, so you know, his was a new podcast that lets listeners in on the kind of casual and clever conversations that people at Duke like to have over a cup of coffee, so perfect. Um, and you know, that, this, this is a, a big um, impetus behind the project, it's worthwhile putting effort into making our research accessible um, because you know, at the end of the day it's kind of frustrating, you spend years working on an article and then three or four people read it and it's so easy in a way just to repackage that scholarship into a five minute video or talk or a programme and you reach a whole different audience and so I think it really um, it's got benefits for everyone involved really, so um, initially I had in mind students and informal learners but also um, you know, the people who were taking part in it, I think it's a really good platform for making research accessible and for myself as well and I think um, you know, working at the Open University sometimes our daily way of working is very much um, sitting at a computer, not really being campus based, potentially feeling a bit isolated and just the chance to kind of go out and meet people and have you know, human contact and fun that was just so attractive so around the same time that I heard about Dan's podcast um, Professor Martin Weller at the OU ran a workshop I think it was called Vodcast Stars or something it sounded quite intriguing so um, Elton Barker at the OU and I went along 
And we got given um, <coughs> these little flip cameras, which I think, I mean, this was 2010, I'm not sure they're still making them anymore. <laughs> and an iPhone would do the job. But I think the simplicity was part of the beauty of it, because it just had one big button at the back. <laughs> um, and so I think pretty much was it the same day or the day after or something? We thought we can do this, you know, we just kind of didn't think too hard about it, didn't really have a strategic vision, didn't think too much about audience, but just sat down in the OU office, um, did an introductory video with the kind of things that we were hoping to get from the channel. And you can, I think you can still watch it on the YouTube channel. Um, our first willing participant was um, now Professor Phil Perkins talking about his research on Etruscan DNA, which is still one of the most popular. It's had 32,000 views and it's been used in other contexts as well. I think a museum in Italy might have used it and it's in an ancient history online encyclopedia. So um, he was a very good sport doing that. Um, and the basic, um, I won't go too much into the technological side of things, but if anyone wants to know for their own podcast or projects um, about things like microphones and software, do ask me afterwards. But it was so simple to start off with. So we just had the flip camera. I'm a Mac user, so I had iMovie, um, signed up for YouTube, WordPress, got a GoDaddy domain name. That was, the, I think, probably the only expenditure to start off with. Um, about £30 just to have a name that didn't have wordpress.com at the end of it. Um, and, you know, it's been go the, the video has carried on until I think early 2016 when we decided to move to audio. Um, oh, yo, Greg, there's you. <laughs> um, this is just a snapshot of the, like, the most recent ones before the um, shift to audio. Just I think you can see from that the kind of variety, so variety of format for one thing. Um, one of the things that Dan Ariely recommended when he, I, I sent him that first clip that we did with Phil, and he starts, that that's really good, but maybe you could be on the camera as well, just to show a bit more of the, um, you know, the dynamism of the de debate and what have you. So most of them have been um, with the uh, interviewer on camera. Different interviewers, so not just um, me or Elton, but we've had um, Anastasia Bakoyani has done loads for us, she's been brilliant, and um, Helen King, um, uh, Tim Whitmarsh actually from Cambridge, um, he asked if he could um, do some interviews that were, were attached to a project that he was doing about monotheism. Um, so we were like more than happy to help with that. And actually, I think that's something that we could do more of. I mean, the video channel is still there, even though we've kind of moved to the audio podcast. I think, I'm thinking that actually it might be quite nice if people did want to kind of do interviews for that channel, which has still got all its subscribers. So that's a possible future direction. Um, but, oh, and Amanda as well. She's <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, so, um, things like you know, school teachers, I went along to Kitchen Girls School and there was a local archaeologist and the head of classics there, um, mainly university academics but also museum professionals who've been into the FITS and into the British Museum to talk about new um, exhibitions that have been going on. Um, even like ventured into the realm of the mini documentary when I went to a conference in Erfurt, so that one with them. Um, um, your Rupka and Georgia Ketridi was about lived ancient medicine and we had to be, did a bit of B film and things, I was getting quite ambitious by the end of it. Um, but it did have its limitations and I think probably the main one is the, um, the, the quality of the recording. So while on the one hand it was fantastic to have this little camera that you could just you know, put in your pocket and then go take to a conference, it didn't mean that you compromised on things. So say I've got my institution to do something, it would have taken longer and we would have had many more hoops to jump through and who knows, maybe it would have never happened, but at least we would have had like really, really crisp and um, professional audio and not necessarily wonky camera angles and things like that. So that was one of the reasons why, um, after having a little bit of a, a break from it, when I was thinking about you know how to how to go back to it, whether to go back to it, um, audio just seems a really um, nice solution. That was again partly because of another OU workshop that I went on with someone and who is name is Documentally, you'll find him on Twitter, Christian Payne, and he's been really, really inspiring and encouraging and um, does all kinds of multimedia workshops at the AU. So I think that's important. You know, we have got this institutional encouragement, which I, th I think is um, you know, makes you feel quite brave and that this is an okay thing to be doing with your time. Um, so 
also discovered a love of podcasts and I just put thank you to Henry Stead who's another person I should have mentioned as somebody who's been interviewing for us but he's not only introduced me to fantastic programs like This American Life but he also knew a lot about the more advanced software and microphones and things so um, I've been talking a lot with him over the, the past year or so about that um, and so now we make um, more thematic well completely thematic programs I think I've got um, a list here. We'll use the same picture. <laughs> that was in yours as well, wasn't it? Um, so, this is what <laughs> These are the ones that I've managed to do so far, starting off with one on sensors. Um, Elton took the lead on one about linking data, so he went off to a conference and gathered lots of audios and then we sat down and recorded a couple more um, and I did a voiceover and I think, did I have my work, oh yeah, so the new workflow you can see is um, quite a bit more complicated, so we've got more um, equipment, um, a, a kind of more expensive and heavy duty editing software, things like um, music and sound effects that you can you need to think about copyright obviously so I brought some of those in and then various ways of delivering and it's it's definitely not perfect now it's kind of it's still here yeah, I've tried out using sound clouds the people at the OU we have a podcast site and someone there helped me to hook it up to iTunes although I haven't figured out how to get analytics for that so I've no idea if anyone's listened to it, but hopefully that will come. So it's a very much trial and error all the way through. Um, but I am, I'm really pleased with the way that the audio programmes are coming along. And I just, you know, I picked the Roman food one as an example because I think also, so one thing I love about the, when you look back over all the videos, it's all the different voices that you've got, you know, people from all different countries, junior and senior scholars. It's been very important to get the support of senior scholars, I think, as well, because, you know, someone like, for instance, Paul Cartledge has been incredibly supportive and done two or three interviews with us and when he's had new books out and things. And I think that that can help to draw people in and then access talks that they might not always have listened to beforehand um, and really learn something from those. Um, so, but this, you kind of get different voices speaking, although they're not all recorded at the same time, but they end up speaking to each other within a half hour episode. So on this one, um, so Zena, talking about places, finding spaces for public engagement, we did ours in the corridor of the British Library. And they, I had to cut out the food trolley from the um, you know, Stephen, he's from Cincinnati, Stephen Ellis is a Pompeii expert, but um, at the Classical Association took the microphone along and bumped into him and um, Mike Beer, who talked about literary depictions of banquets, um, uh, but also drawing in other communities and sectors. So um, Salvatore Gaviano, who um, owns a fantastic bacon patisserie in, um, in Pompeii, he recorded something about how he's been working with ancient Pompeian foods. Um, and then um, from other academic disciplines as well. So I went to another religious studies conference and um, Patricia from Brazil, um, she contributed into about Kingdom Blair and I think that we managed to make that fit <coughs> nicely with the work that Zena was, Zena was doing. Um, and so yeah, do, have a listen if you, if you have time. And the other ones, you, I don't know if you can see them there, but um, a lot of it has been sort of as and when opportunities arise. So I got contacted by someone who'd just done a volume on East Africa and the classical tradition and said, oh, can we do something for Classics Confidential on that? And thought about it. And then the, with Henry's help, kind of came to UCL and did some recording and made that one work as well. Um, yeah. I didn't predict that time would come up for everyone. Um, obviously, like this is the major challenge now. Um, the editing takes a while. Um, I consider it a hobby, really. I, I, I love doing the audio editing. It's almost like sculpting when you get together all the different tracks and you have to make things fit and raise and lower and cut out kitchen trolleys and what have you. So I, I love it, but it does take you. You kind of have to be in the zone. I think it probably takes a whole day to. Um, edit a program and it, I mean how often do you have a whole day which isn't filled up with other duties like you know, teaching and admin and research so it, time is a big big struggle and I suppose it's good that nobody is sitting there kind of waiting for the next episode to come out because uh, you know there isn't a timetable or a deadline but I would love to have a bit more time and do it more often and also I'm aware you know, I, I recorded a lot of footage at the Classical Association Conference last year and some of it I haven't been able to edit yet, I still want to, I hope that pe you know, people won't think that they're, what they said then is now obsolete but um, you know, it's, it, that, that's been the major issue for me so 
not really sure how to um, get around that one. Um, just very quickly engaging with listeners. I yeah, tried, um, set up a hashtag, Classics Confides. I don't think it's been very well used and we don't really get very many comments on the site apart from YouTube where they're not always the most constructive comments. <laughs> Particularly we've got some a couple of interviews, one about religion and one about ethnicity and you know the comments are off and every now if you want to feel depressed I can go in and read them but that hasn't really been a great platform for public, you know, positive public engagement. Um, I, I, you know, if people listen to them, they listen to them in the car while they're doing the ironing and they learn something, they get interested in a topic, I'm okay with that. I think a sort of passive engagement for me is fine and I'm, I haven't really done much work in you know, asking for comments or things that could be fed into a, a ref impact study. Um, hopefully that's okay anyway. Um, so just finished now, but these are the ones that I've got in my Dropbox file. Where some, of the, all, some of these are almost complete, we need one more interview, but these are the ones that I think I'll be working on over the next few months. And um, If you can see a way of making your research fit in any of those, it would be lovely to have more voices on there. So I'm afraid I can't stay around this afternoon, and um, that's disappointing, but um, please do get in touch by email or on Twitter. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So our last speaker for the morning is Jen Grove, um, who's here from the University of Exeter. Um, she's an interdisciplinary classicist and historian, um, and her work kind of also uses approaches to things like the history of medicine, the history of sexuality, art history and museum studies, um, and lots of what Jen does focuses on engaged research. She's worked since 2009 on the Sex and History Project, which is directed by Professors Kate Fisher and Rebecca Langland. Um, and the project <coughs> uses objects from cultures of the past, not just classical culture, um, to discuss sex and relationships. Um, and it's been hugely successful. <laughs> um, to the point that last year it was um, given an award by the Family Planning Association for innovation and good practice in relationships and sex education. So, what's the Thank you so much, and thanks Emma for inviting me and for that introduction because that kind of cuts off a bit of the time that I was going to uh, use on introducing myself and the project. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's really great to see. Um, you know everyone here, and I, I, I also was part of the um, communicating Greece and Rome AHIC well, we project before yeah. <laughs> the, this cohort. So it's really interesting to see how we've all developed since then. So, um, uh, first of all, just to say that um, Rebecca Langlands, um, unfortunately, was was going to be here, but she's not able to be here. So I'm representing her as well. Um, as Emma said, um, Rebecca is a classicist. Um, Kate Fisher, who also directs the project, is a historian. I'm a sort of interdisciplinary between history and um, classics, I guess. Um, and as, as Emma's um, told you, the Sex and History Project is a sort of very long running, I guess we want to really call it a sort of program of projects, really, because it's, we've, we've done so many sort of different activities over the years, almost 10 years now. And sort of at its heart, we use um, objects from the past in innovative approaches to sex education and sexual health. So using objects from the past to get people today, particularly young people, to think critically about sex and gender. Um, so we've done a whole range of, um, of projects and activities, as I say, and, and I'll just sort of really briefly go through stuff now, and maybe you want, you know, we can talk about it later if you're interested, just because um, for, for time's sake, but uh, we work with um, museums, obviously with museum collections, um, but also with sex ed and sexual health um, experts, with schools, colleges, creative art organisations, and we've, as I say, we've sort of done a range of work um, from things like um, museum exhibitions to uh, creative projects, so uh, youth-led film projects, for example, I've just um, finished a, 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 a uh, project using um, uh, digital engagement, so creating a digital game with um, some young people and a digital artist. Um, we've run uh, sort of ad hoc uh, uh, workshops and, uh, and events for schools and youth groups. And our um, most recent work in the last few years has been focused really on um, producing, sorry, there's some more um, uh, images from, from one of our main exhibitions that we did. This is a group of college students um, putting on a production of the Lysistrata, or, or uh, 
sections of it, responding to some of the objects that we had in our exhibition. So, um, so we can talk more later if you're interested. Um, but our latest work over the last few years has been focused on producing resources and teacher training for um, sex and relationships education within secondary schools. So this is um, a resource pack that we've developed with Brooke, who are the the sort of leading sexual health uh, charity in, in the UK, and also with the uh, South West Group, the um, Relationships and Sex Education Hub. And um, this resource pack is based on material from the Welcome Collection, so just around the corner, you know, not too far from here. Um, Welcome obviously famously collected medical history um, materials, and he also is sort of less well known that he had this massive. Um, collection of um, sexually related um, historical artifacts from um, across world cultures. Um, so we use that's that's the sort of basis of this pack. Um, and then most recently, I've been leading on this project, which is um, a sort of specially commissioned uh, project, a website using material from across UK collections. So we've got people like the British Museum in there, the V&A. Um, specifically around LGBT focused lessons and again we can sort of talk about that later if you're interested. Um, so just to say um, very briefly we've sort of we have uh, developed uh, what we think is a, um, a really strong methodology about using um, historical objects to tackle some of the challenges that sex educators face and we have published on this, uh, we're talking about publication, we've published on this in um, a sex education Volume, so it's interesting, you know, we're, uh, where as we were talking about, you know, where we publish this stuff. So we sort of published in a in a volume uh, that was focusing on research into innovative approaches to um, sex and relationships education. Um, so I won't go into these all now, but basically the idea is one of the key issues that um, sex educators face is about embarrassment, is about sort of uncomfortableness of young people talking to adults or teachers about um, sex and relationships. And so uh, using an object, so we sort of have this object as the focus of the discussion, so you know, sort of everyone in, in, in a session with the object in the middle or an image of the object in the middle. And we find that by having that focus on the object, people can talk through that object and also talk about um, cultures that aren't necessarily their own or, or, or societies from the past and it reduces that embarrassment of talking about sex and, and, and gender and these kinds of issues. So they, what we find is that they start by talking about the object and the historical context and then it very naturally moves into a conversation about today and about their own concerns. And as we all know, um, you know, all of us here I'm sure uh, have experienced how looking to the past can help us to look at ourselves and, and the present day in, with a critical eye and that's something that sex educators say they're really in need of, not just about imparting knowledge or information about STIs and, and pregnancy as, as important as that is, but an opportunity for young people to really critique and think about how our norms today um, work um, and how they're produced. So um, that's to say, sort of a whistle-stop tour of what we do and our method. Um, and just to say that, um, as Emma said, you know, we do use a range of materials. So you can see there, that's some objects from the Welcome Collection, which aren't classical. We do also use classical material. But I just wanted to kind of highlight that the project really does, in, in lots of ways, develops from the classical reception work that we've been doing at Exeter. So. Um, <coughs> Kate and Rebecca's work in particular looks at or, um, how uh, artifacts or material from the past, particularly um, the material found at Pompeii and Herculaneum, and it's um, uh, the, 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 the massive amount of sort of sexually related material that was found there and the sort of apparent open display of that material. They've done work looking at how, right from you know, the beginning, from its, from its discovery um, in the modern period, it's been this really important... <laughs> competing with some cups. Um, a really important reference point for, for modern people to think about the role of sex um, in society and particularly around sexual imagery in contemporary society. So make, helping people right up until the present day think about, consider where we are now in, you know, in comparison with the Romans. Um, and so a sort of example of that, this is one of the lesson plans that we've developed <coughs> using, this is again, this is material from the Welcome Collection, but I think uh, look, looking at the collection history, I think this stuff is from Pompeii. 
Uh, the middle object is a copy, by the way, so just so you, if, you're if you're worried about that, uh, that's the copy of an, um, an object from the Naples Museum there in the middle, the, the, the Tintin Abinum. Um, so uh, just to point out, I want to sort of say that we would use this kind of material with older pupils, so we have material that's less sort of explicit for younger, for younger children. Um, and so the, the, the format of the lessons would be we provide these high-res images, um, for teachers to use in the classroom, either to print out or put up on a screen. Um, we provide these videos, so there's Rebecca talking as a kind of expert talking head um, to sort of give some historical context and historical information, and they can show those videos. And then we provide um, sort of suggested questions that the teachers might use, um, discussion points, and then also some activities that they can use as a sort of um, extension activities to deepen the learning. So we something like this, uh, so we ask them, this is like a PowerPoint, you know, example PowerPoint we provide, we ask the young people, imagine if you went back to Roman times, how would you respond to seeing these kind of objects, you know, just around in the street, and then we get them to think about, you know, imagine if a Roman uh, came here, how would, they, how would they respond to some of the images that they see today? So it can get people thinking about the sort of differences between um, the meanings of pornography, of art, erotica, how different cultures frame these um, in different ways, who should and, um, and, um, and who can access images of sex in our society, how we respond to images of, of sex um, in society, not just erotica or pornography, but maybe sort of sexualized images that we see in the, in the media, um, and what those images mean to us. So, um, oh, that's another one. Yeah. Uh, so just to say, I guess I wanted to reflect on some of the questions that Emma set us, that she gave to us before uh, the for today. And one thing that I wanted to say was that I, because I've been, I was doing this work. Um, so one of the questions that Emma asked was, um, what can you get from doing this practice-based research that you can't get from doing from, from sitting in a library, basically? Um, and so I wanted to sort of comment on the fact that I've been doing this stuff. Um, right from the beginning of my PhD, and, and in fact, it was really a, it was really the reason why I chose to do the PhD and the postdoc. I, I, I personally, for myself, wouldn't do academia without the engagement side. I, for, for my own work and practice, I find that really important to be able to make those links with people outside of academia and feel like you're you're you're, you're um, helping people to relate to their own lives. Um, and, and I found, in particular, for my for for my own research, really useful because my own um, my thesis looked at how um, ancient artifacts allowed people in the late 19th and early 20th century to negotiate ideas about sex and sexuality, and that, that included looking at the history of the Welcome Collection and how he collected Welcome, this this um, this sexually related material. So for me, kind of being there live, seeing how people today respond to these very same objects. Um, has really helped me in thinking about how people in the early 20th century responded to them. So thinking about the, like particularly the different, the, the variety of interpretations that people can, can draw out from this material really helped me with thinking through about how people in early, earlier periods might have responded to this stuff. And that also goes not just for the reception of it, the modern reception, but also the ancient context. So thinking about how ancient um, people might, might have responded to this stuff. Um, and uh, so just some other sort of practical considerations. I wanted to say something about partners. So I tr I've tried there to just put on some of the partners that we've worked with, and I kind of just got a bit lost. Of it. Kind of, this, is, uh, I may, this isn't, definitely doesn't cover all of them, is what I'm saying. Uh, this is just a sort of representation of the, the different people that we've worked with, and that's from, um, from really uh, uh, massive organisations like the you know, British Museum down to freelancers. Um, and, and really, I guess what I wanted to say is um, <coughs> it took a lot of time. You know, we've been working on this for a long time and a lot of networking in order to get to where we are now. Um, and now it's great because people approach us and it's kind of snowball, but it really did take that kind of perseverance of going out there and talking to people. So I've gone and presented at sex education um, you know, practice uh, conferences, things like that, obviously connecting with museum um, colleagues as well, but really sort of taking every opportunity we could to, to kind of get this 
this stuff out there and find the right people to work with. And, I, and that's another thing I wanted to say is talking about, I think other people have commented on this, but the importance of relationships, so individual relationships is so important. And the two people that we work with now who are Esther McGinney, who is formerly at Brooks, she's actually freelance now, and this is Alice Hoyle of RSE Hub. We have this really amazing relationship with them now, but again, that did take a long time to sort of build that build that up. And one of the dangers that we have, we experience, and I'm sure lots of other people have experienced, is that risk of when you build that relationship and then that person has to leave the job. You know, if they have these precarious positions, particularly in places like museums, um, it can, it, 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 that is a real danger, I think. And we're really lucky because Alice and Esther have both um, moved as they've moved jobs, they've actually stayed with the project so that we've managed to, to continue to work with them as, as they've moved <coughs> organisations, which is, um, I don't think, you know, that's not necessarily usual. Um, so thinking about kind of what we need from the partners, we need them, we talked about before about language, about getting the right language for your audience, so we definitely need them to make our work credible and make, get the right language for the young people to... Um, to connect with it but also for teachers but as I say now I think what's really nice is because we've worked with them for so long and we've, we've um, on, on several different projects really I think you know we really do co-write this material now it's not a case of kind of here's our historical research or here's some historical information and they turn it into a lesson plan it really is a sort of we, we really merge our our expertise and, and I feel like we now as historians and classicists we sort of really understand the sex education side of it um, uh, you know we can sort of almost do that stuff ourselves we still need them you know but 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 and also they are now really good at the history stuff so I did an event recently with Alice and I just left her to it and she was there talking about the history of all these objects it was amazing and I realized how much she'd actually you know she really enjoys now being able to talk about the the research as well um, so it's interesting to think about, I guess, where when you're collaborating with people, kind of how how much you retain your role as an expert and how much your roles sort of merge and the new skills that you might learn. Um, and then just to say what they get out of it, they've definitely told us that their practice has um, developed from doing this stuff. So it's not just about again like us paying for them, commissioning them to do this work for us. Their thinking in terms of, for example, things like. <coughs> Um, gender identity, which is a really tricky topic that, that lots of teachers and educators are struggling with um, in terms of how to talk about it in the classroom. They've told us that their thinking and their practice and their guidance that they give to, to teachers generally has moved on and has been, um, as it has been impacted by this work that they've done with the historical objects. Um, so just briefly to say... Oh, something about funding I was going to say um, it's you know it's always really tricky obviously and we've kind of never we've been doing this for 10 years and uh, we've never had core funding um, we've never had sort of constant funding so it's always been sort of fits and starts of where we've where we've been able to apply for funding and there's been opportunities we've taken those opportunities where we can and and then run with it and, and done some work and we have had uh, we've ha had several unsuccessful funding applications which obviously as you all know take a lot of time and energy to do um, but really I suppose I wanted to say that what we managed to do is whenever there's been a pot of money that's come up that we think we can apply for we've always had because we've got so many sort of different arms to the project we've always had some idea and some way that we can sort of something that we can apply for um, so I think it's about sort of being creative and 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 all, yeah, always having some kind of inspiration, some kind of idea that if you see that that opportunity, you can apply for it and sort of fit your your project into that scheme if you know if you want to. Um, and in terms of other resources, there are three of us, which does really help. I think um, the day to day running of things. I'm still sort of the the day to day coordinator of the projects, and we are hoping to get a student intern actually soon because I think that will really help. Um, because as you know, other people have said that just that right you know even as you say just one event can take weeks and weeks of planning and admin and emailing and all this stuff and obviously we're lucky because we 
in the university we do well we we do have some administrative um, support which is fantastic you know as as um, as academics but you know it really does take that time to do that coordination and we sort of basically like you're saying we do it as a side you know it's a hobby really you know that's that's how we see you know, it's, it's a side project that we love and we want to carry on doing so um, just thinking about audiences um, I just wanted to say that one of the questions that Emma asked us to think about was not preach. How do we not preach to the converted? So not just reaching the, the kind of regular the, the audiences that would already be interested in this stuff. And I suppose, I mean, for us, fit going with schools is the answer to that because young people have to be there. I mean, they, you know, if, you're, if you do a lesson, they don't have a choice. Uh, well, I mean, there is some issues there with sex education because the parents can withdraw them. But anyway, that's a separate issue. But I would say that. Um, with schools, obviously, if you can fit into the curriculum, fantastic. We haven't so far been part of the national curriculum because sex education wasn't on the national curriculum, but that situation now, fingers crossed, is now changing. So next year, relationships and sex education, uh, the sort of stuff that we do, hopefully, is going to be part of what schools have to do, and so they will have to prioritise that. So our whole project you know, might be sort of changing in that sense. Um, but really, I mean, there are lots of schools out there that were interested in doing this stuff. They are very time limited, very pressured, and so it, it, we really we did find it very hard for the first few years to get into schools, um, and it, it was really tricky. I think being if we had funding, providing free teacher training and support for teachers was really you know fantastic, and that included paying for teachers buyout time to come to our training. So if you've got that that money that if when we did have the opportunity to do that that you know really helped because teachers then great you know they've got some free funding um, some free training sorry for sex education some free resources all our resources are free online as well um, I would say six one colleges were easier to get into because they have more flexibility and also we worked with a pupil referral unit in Exeter which is a, um, a place where young people who have been excluded from mainstream school go um, and they, were, they also had a lot more flexibility. We could sort of work really closely with them in a very intensive and bespoke way to develop something with them and that kind of that was obviously very useful for them, but it also for us gave us that opportunity to get experience with schools and sort of show evidence of this method working in different contexts. Um, I would say also, just with bond schools, one thing that we've learned is that um, we've been part of a national project um, program. Uh, schools University Partnership Initiative which was run by the um, National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement um, and one thing that came out of that was that schools love being part of a research project, being part of a development project so if you can get in there and, and get the young people feeling like and the teachers feeling that they're actually part of developing something new they really really appreciated that and they really enjoyed that so that was really good as well. Um, as I say, you know, just I suppose just to reiterate, you know, it's taken us a long time to get where we are. We're now part of a, um, the, we're a national partner, sorry, we're a partner for the national body, the Sex Education Forum, which obviously gives us this really great credibility and access and, um, and you know, that's, that's been amazing. But as I say, you know, they only offered us that membership last year. So that's a long time of working um, and putting in this, this work. Um, and, um, and as Emma said, I suppose I should acknowledge that we got this award um, last year. So we were highly commended for um, innovative approaches to sex education, which is amazing, you know, for a, a, a national award you know, to have that recognition from a set from the sector, you know, this non-academic sector was amazing. Um, but, re you know, this is also down to our amazing partners that we work with, that they are really in incredible um, and really credible within the sex education, sexual health wor world. So I suppose just to conclude, I wanted to say my advice would be, be flexible, um, as Michael said, you know, if you maybe think about starting small, you know, that's, that's, that can be so useful. We've done so much sort of testing different methods in small ways um, in different contexts. Um, and so we've been able to get evidence of this method working in, in different places. I would say also, I haven't really touched on it here, but get as much evaluation from the start as you can. So you've got this evidence for funders for your university, but also for yourself so that you can see that your method and what you're doing really does make a difference um, and is really reaching the right people and the right audiences. Thank you. Well, thank you.